Hello. So this is all done with fields. It's kind of the thing you can do. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you, Maxon, for bringing me out. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And thank you, the internet, for watching. So how's that for a hello? Hello Lux. Uh, many of you know me from Hello Lux, which is a, it's kind of started out as a blog. And um, we have about 100 free tutorials there. Cinema 4D, a few After Effects, X Particles, Octane, all that stuff. And we also do paid training. We just released a new product. So if you use Redshift, this is uh, by Rich Nosworthy, who's an incredibly talented guy. It's an amazing bit of training. Volume 1, there will be some more. And there's a bit of a shortage of Redshift training for cinema. So if you do use it, definitely head over and check it out. There's a free chapter you can watch. HelloLux.com. Lux is my uh, main business. We're a production company based in Sydney, very small. Pull in freelancers, work with other studios, work directly with clients, all sorts of stuff. And uh, this is the work we do. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, many studios involved in that, not just Lux. We get to work with the other studios, people like Kin Things, Buck, Tendril, um, Never Sit Still. Anyway, check out uh, Lux.tv for full credits because definitely a lot of amazing, talented people involved in that. I don't know who's feeding back there. So anyway, what I'm here to talk about is R20, Cinema 4D, release 20. It's pretty awesome. I've been using Cinema since uh, version 5. Getting on a bit now, um, but this is the, probably one of the best releases since um, probably MoGraph. For me, it's just amazing. And what I want to talk about today is the new fields. Fields. So, you know, wait a minute, what? What are fields? Fields actually are really simple. They are like the new generation of fall off, but actually they're like a whole new way of tr spreading data through cinema. Um, but essentially, they're just... Uh, control with value. And one of the developers explained to me how they work. Um, one way is an analogy of uh, like comparing it to an alpha channel. And we all know how alpha channels work. We have like a white pixel, we have a black pixel. If we have a black pixel, then it makes our image transparent. If we have a white pixel, it makes our image opaque. So really, you're looking at a value between like black and white, or 0 and 1, or 0 to 100, and any of those in-between values. And that's all, in a, uh, all the fields do. But they do it with uh, maybe how high you're going to move a cube, or maybe how far a vertex is going to move on a displacer. Or it could be like a shader. The other cool thing about fields is that we can blend them. Um, and it's a really interesting implementation because it's so easily accessible to everyone. If you've used fall off at all, then you, your progression into using fields will be totally natural. If you've used an image in editing package, like Photoshop, for instance, then you're going to be immediately at home, because the UI is just like working with layers in Photoshop. So this example here is, a, is, a, is an interesting way of showing it, because what I've done here is use three spherical fields. We can now change the color in the fall off itself in the field rather than on the effector. You can do it either way. But using the fields is a lot more um, versatile, I guess. So here I've got a red, green, and blue one. And then I've just used add composite mode to create this obvious hue wheel, which is something we're all familiar with. But this is all done using the vertex color tag and rendered in cinema. And it just, I think this is an easy way to sort of understand how it works, because we can all immediately relate to this kind of stuff. 
But rather than just show you slides, what I thought we'd do is jump into cinema and have a look. I'm going to start off with some basic stuff of how, of how fields work. So here I've got a matrix object. And one of the options on the matrix object down here is that we can use form object. So I've dragged in this extrude. It says, hello. Hello, Lux. Um, and then I've got a couple of effectors. So for example, a random effector. If we enable that, it's set to randomize our position, color, and scale. If we come to the fall off tab, we can see the new interface. So I've added some fields in here already. Um, but we can add them all from this list. And we've got three different types. So we've got objects. We've got these, which are maybe solid layers or linked to other elements in your scene. And we've also got these, which are like adjustment layers. Um, so if I enable the spherical field, now we've got this. And well, it's the wrong one selected. You notice that we can select them actually in the field list. Even though I've got the random effector selected, I can also select the fields in here and move it around. It gives you this temporary transformation, which is pretty cool. Notice that the fields themselves are now separate objects to the effectors, which means we can share them between all of our effectors, um, which is much better workflow. Before the fall off was tied to the effector, now it's separate. So that's pretty cool. So this isn't really anything too groundbreaking. We could already do this kind of stuff. But now, obviously, we have this freedom where we can apply them to other effectors. So here I've got a formula effector. If I enable that, I can just drag my spherical field in there. So now we're containing that, that effect to, um, within that one spherical fall off, which means that it's very easy to adjust it and move it around. And it will, wherever it's used, it's going to ripple through. On top of that, we can um, also stack them, as I said before. So here we've got a box field. If I enable this, you can see that that's set to subtract. So now we're doing Boolean operations with our fall offs. So the field here is going to subtract from that other field. So which is pretty handy. You can use all sorts of shapes, objects, splines, everything as fields. I'm just trying to sort of show you the real simple approach to start with. The great thing about this new, uh, whatever, I'd, whatever you want to call it, the new method of doing it, is that we can use them in various places, but we can actually use them in different ways as well. So in this example, I could set this to add here. And now I'm going to get the formula in the cubic fall off over here and here in the sphere. So if I select this box field, I can move that around and we're just con con containing the formula there. And you can see at the same time it's subtracting from the random. So this gives us so much control. And obviously we can stack them and build complicated setups. That one's nice and simple. Moving on, let's have a look at another example. So in this example, I wanted to build something very similar but showing you another way that we can use fields. Everyone who's used Cinema and Fall Off are going to be used to using them with effectors. But we can use them with loads of different objects throughout our scene. We can use them with tags. We can use them with deformers, um, all sorts of things. So in this example, I have a color vertex tag. We can choose down here, use fields. That brings up the fields interface. And we get this freeze layer. We're going to, I'm going to talk about that a bit later. But the freeze layer is like a way of storing data. So if you'd already painted onto your map, maybe it's a polygon selection, maybe it's a vertex map, maybe it's an edge selection. When you enable the freeze layer, it stores all that information there. And then you can reuse that to do other things. But the nice thing about this is that we can now create these tags and these maps procedurally. So in this example, I have a vertex color. What I'm going to do is drag in my spherical field. And you can see that it makes it go orange. And that's because we can now control color. So on my spherical field, I've got this color remap. And you can see here, I can adjust the color. So the thing about fields that's so powerful is that you are actually like transferring the data. It's a data unification system, in a way. And you're moving data between all these different places. So at the moment, we're starting off with the, the color information. And we're passing that into a vertex color tag. And then if we take a material, such as this one, we put in a vertex map shader, and then we can pass that tag into there, put that on a material, and then we're passing that information from the field into the tag, into the material as a shader, and then we can render it. As I say, we can stack these. So let's add in a random field. So this is a very similar setup to the last one. But the last one, I was using effectors. This time, I'm using just fields. You can see in the interface that we have these little icons. So these ones refer to the value. Do we want that field to affect the value of a parameter? Or do we want it to affect color? 
So you can use the same field in different ways. Maybe you want to use add mode for your value, and then you want to use overlay for the color or something. So on here, I'm just going to switch off the color. There you go. But I'm going to set this to overlay. And you can see now that's overlaying on top. So it's just like doing an overlay as if you're comping in After Effects or something. Of course, our spherical field is the main layer here. So if we grab that around, we can reveal that everywhere. Let's drag in this formula field as well. And let's set this to overlay. So now it's a different result than last time, but it's using the same kind of principle. And if I press play, you can see we've got some animated random noise. We've got a little bit of a pulse going from the formula. And we've got our spherical field, which is helping us contain all of that. So all of those fields are combining together. The values are all, all the maths is happening there in the background. And then it's going into that vertex color tag, onto the shader, into the material, so that we can render it. But now what we can do as well is we can take this information. Maybe we want to come to the fields. We could select all of these in here. And you can copy them. So then we could come to our displacer. And we could paste them in here. It's even easier than that, actually. You can come to the tag, and you can choose on the fields parameter. You can right click, and you can set driver, and then come to the displacer. And then you can choose expression set driven. So you can basically link that parameter with an expression. And whatever you do in the tag will then flow straight into the displacer. So it's really nice and quick. I'm actually not going to do any of those things. I'm going to just come to my shading tab. I'm going to come down, add in a vertex map shader. And then we can drag our vertex color tag into here. And now you can see that that displacement is now also happening. And it's being driven by exactly the same fields. So if I come and change that random field, it's going to change all of those different elements without me having to go to all my different objects and change it. It's like flowing that data through. And that, to me, is one of the key features of working with this new system. So coming back to the old keynote in here, um, what I wanted to do was kind of go through Rather than just show examples like that, maybe show some real world projects and how we could do them using R20 and how our workflow might be a lot easier now. So I did a job recently with Buck. Always one of my kind of aspirations to work for Buck. And um, they opened an office in Sydney, which is fantastic. They came and asked me to work for them, done a few jobs with them now. And, and this was a huge project. It was for Nike. And there were, it was like, it was Buck Sydney, but it was truly international because we had. Um, we got one trainer each, or one sneaker each. And uh, James Owen was in New York. He worked on one. And then there's Chris Phillips. No, James in LA, sorry. Chris Phillips in New York. Geordie Pages in Barcelona. Twisted Polly in Slovenia. And me in Sydney. And of course, the great team at Buck. One of the loveliest companies I'm ever going to work for. So I only did a small piece of this job. Let's just watch it. OK, so nice thing about Buck is they always put all the credits on their site. So visit buck.tv, and you can see all the people that worked on this job. Huge, huge number of people involved. Um, big up to Gareth and Lucas, the creative directors there. Wonderful guys. And the art direction from Buck is second to none. Like, it's, it's a real nice job, like smooth. Everything goes well. Pretty challenging work to do, but like an absolute joy. Really lovely company to work with. So as I say, I only did some of the shots on this. So this shot, for example, I did the AJ3. And it was nice because all the shoes were white. So they went for these really crazy bright palettes with loads of saturated color, really lovely contrast. And each shoe, they specified a certain palette. So in this shot here, I just used cloth for this in cinema. And it's like the, the basketball court is sort of rippling. So it's almost like I grab a piece of cloth and then kind of like whip it like this. And you get this nice ripple flowing through. I did this shot here with the, where, the, where the, all the boards lift up like an elephant. And this was all done just using pose morph in cinema. So we just create morph targets for each one of these. And then using like fall off, wipe it through so that it lifts up and comes back down. 
the final shot of the shoe. This one, I set this up. Um, and then I had to go to Bali for a few weeks. So this one was handed over to Twisted Polly, who finished it off. So it was really, truly a collaborative piece. The shot that I want to talk about is this one. And this is, this is where we have all these kind of ripples lifting up and flowing across. And I wanted to um, have a look at how we set this up in R19. And then I'll show you how you can use fields to make this like, so much easier. Um, and it's an unusual use of fields as well that you wouldn't necessarily think of. So I, I think it's like a, a good example of the flexibility of the system. So here we go. So at first glance, it's not that challenging, the actual shot. But it's a little bit tricky, because one of the things we had to do, and this is the actual shot from the job. One thing you notice as well is that it's like square. Because of all the social media and everything, we had, like, the buck had the challenge that they had to try and make it work in landscape, portrait, and square. And rather than do three versions of every single shot, we decided that, or Buck decided to do it as a square thing. So everything was rendered at 1920 by 1920, which is a little bit tricky from a kind of art direction point of view, because it makes it slightly awkward and difficult to compose each shot so you know that it's going to work cropped to all those different shapes. But I think they did a pretty good job of it. Anyway, let's have a look what we've got here. So you can see I've got a whole bunch of subdivision surfaces. And if I fold that down, we've basically got loads of displaces um, in each one of these wooden panels. And the reason it's set up like this is because you'll notice that here, we have this gap between each displacement. So for instance, this one is like 20%, 40%, 60 and 80%. And there's no real way of doing that easily without using a separate displacer for each one. So I mean, I had to have a separate deformer for each, for each lump on every single bump, which it means we end up with however many there are here, like 30 or so. So to make it a bit easier on each one, I set up a constraint tag, link them all to this null, which means that we can grab this and pull them back backwards and forwards. And that at least links the position of all of them. But the problem with this approach is that if the client says, oh, I want to make the bumps a bit higher, or I want to change the shape of them, then we have to go through each and every one of these displacers and make sure they're all in harmony. So when we come to one of these, and we, for instance, we want to change like the, the fall off, we've got this curve that's the shape of it, then we'd have to go to each and every one and adjust that spline or copy and paste it to each one. So not the most efficient workflow. Now, though, things are a lot easier. So in this example, I've got the same kind of setup, but this time I'm going to use a cloner, which immediately makes it easier. Couldn't do that before because we needed a separate deformer for each clone. If I could just come down to the camera, and you can see this is pretty much exactly the same shot. I just grabbed the camera, et cetera, from the other file. So now I've got a displacer here. I'm going to just enable that displacer. And you can see that by default, what happens with this displacer, I've just got a white color in there. So it just displaces everything. The displacement is set to be along plane R on the Y orientation. So it just pushes all the geometry up. Now, one of the cool things about the new field system is that we can use tags as well. So here I've got some tags. If I select this MoGraph selection tag, you can see down here we've got the option use fields. So we can use fields with tags, which means that we can procedurally generate our MoGraph selections, or we can procedurally generate polygon selections and things like this, which opens up a whole new world of possibilities. Not only can we use fields with tags, though, we can also use tags as fields. So rather than using this option here, I'm going to come to my displacer under the fall off tab. I can just drag my MoGraph selection in. And now you can see that what's happening here, the, the clones that are selected, the yellow ones, they're the only ones that are now receiving the displacement. So it kind of seems a little bit trivial in a way, I guess. But it's actually a bit of a game changer, to be honest, because it means that you can now control deformation on hundreds and thousands of clones with single deformers just by using a selection tag on them, rather than having to split out the geometry and have lots of separate objects. So it's kind of like a million times more efficient. We can then take like our spherical field, for instance, drop this in on top. If I set this, if I just drop it in normally, we lose the selection. And because that, that layer is set to normal mode, so if you think in Photoshop, if you put an opaque layer into Photoshop, it's going to hide everything underneath. So we can either adjust the opacity of this, or we can just use a blending mode. So I could just set this to multiply. And there we go. And you can see that now we're using the spherical field in combination with the selection. So it gives us a lot more control. But it, just, it actually gets even better than this. If we take this one out, here I've got a MoGraph weight tag. And once again, we can use fields with that. 
But you notice the colors from the weight tag. If I just come here, so you can sort of see them. The middle one here, it's got a weight of like 100. And then we've got 80, 60, 40, 20. So normally you would use these with effectors, and it controls the amount of strength that effector will apply to the certain clones. But we can actually use this with deformers as well now. So if I come back to my displacer and I drag this tag into the field here, in fact, hold on, let me just take this out for a moment. Let's drag that in. And you can see now that what's happening is it's using the weight of that tag to control the amount of deformation that's happening. So the selection tags allows us to choose which clone, and then the weight tag allows us to choose the strength of that deformation. So that's an incredible amount of control. And then we combine it with our spherical field. And you can see now I've achieved what I did in the previous job with one displacer and one field. Instead of using one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten deformers, I've done it with one deformer. Immediately, it's a lot more efficient. And honestly, you could do that whole job with one displacer. We can come down, we can add in another spherical field. OK, again, it overrides because it's set to normal. Maybe we set it to add. You can see now that's adding. But we're getting a different result on that one. So what we really need to do is we need to composite our two fields together and then multiply that on top. So in Photoshop, you would use a layer group. In After Effects, you'd pre-comp it. Here, we just add in a folder. Bob's your uncle. All done. So we just drop this one in here. We set this one to normal. And then we multiply the whole thing over. And it's worked just like that. So you can see now. What, what, what this means is that with this displacer, we've got like a global control for the whole thing. And then the spherical fall-offs, we can fine-tune that for all the others. So I can come to my displacer, and I can just say, all right, I want to make them all a bit higher, or I want to make them all a bit lower. So I can keep my client happy much quicker. If I come to the spherical fields themselves, under the remapping tab, we have controls for the strength. So rather than animate the displacer itself, we can animate the strength of each field which will give us the same result. And if we wanted this one on the left to be like the hero and the one on the right to be not quite as important, then we can come to the remapping tab and we can adjust our minimum and maximum values. So we can just say, OK, the maximum this one can go is 50%. So wherever we set our displacer, this one can only go halfway as high. And so now if I take this up to 100%, you can see that second one isn't quite as high. So by doing this, our light lives are going to be much easier. <laughs> so yeah, it's pretty cool. When I discovered that, I was like, oh my god, that's amazing. <laughs> um, yeah. Jumping back into Keynote, let's have a look at something else. So Sydney Opera House. We did a job for Sydney Opera House. And Sydney Opera House is this big, white, pointy building in Sydney. And they do operas there. Um, I'm going to see Wu-Tang in December, which is like the most anti-opera. but. Looking forward to it. Every year they do this thing called Vivid, where they light up the whole of Sydney, basically. But the Opera House is probably the most exciting and prestigious of all of the project projections. It's a massive canvas, you know. It's quite daunting. And a company called Spin Effects um, came to me and uh, to Lux and said that they had the job. And it's funny because at the same time, Ash Bolland, who was the director, and he used to work for a company. He used to run a company called Umeric. He's an incredibly talented guy. He came to me separately as well and said, Tim, do you want to come and do the Opera House? I'm like, yeah. Anyway, it ended up that we ended up doing like nine and a half minutes of this job at Lux. Um, it's 15 minutes in total. So they subcontracted it up to us, and then we kind of just rolled with it. And it was basically me and my good friend, Mike Tossetto. Mike Tossetto runs a studio called Never Sit Still. Um, and also had a guy called Dan Bragger working with me at the time. And we did pretty much all of those nine and a half minutes in seven weeks, 6K. Didn't see my kids much. Um, but at the end of it, it was pretty amazing to do. Also had a few guys, Rich Nosworthy helped out a little bit, and Twisted Polly did, a, did some work on it as well. So these are some shots from it. You can see the small little people. Gives you an idea of how big it is. And they actually project it right across the harbor. And they use, I think, 16 projectors or 12, I'm not sure. Six projectors just for the main sail. Uh, Mike kind of owned this shot. There's a close-up of it. You can stand right under it. It's pretty amazing. It goes on for a few weeks. This is one that Rich and I worked on. 
It's really nice. You get this sort of transparency through the sails. This butterfly shot, we had all the... Each section was done with cloth. We belted them together, and they sort of unfurled like flags fluttering out. And then this is what I really wanted to talk about. Uh, we had this like, weird parasites that grew over the surface. And the, and the thing here is the growing technique. And I wanted it to, we wanted it to feel kind of organic. So we used like a combination of shader effectors with noise, noise patterns and um, spherical fall off. And it was, it was reasonably successful. It's weird with projections because you, if you've ever done them, you have to do everything really slowly. And it's kind of funny watching it on a monitor because your monitors are so small. But if you think about like if you stood on the top of a like, skyscraper and dropped a football, the amount of time it would take to hit the ground is quite a long time. But when you watch that on a computer screen, it seems to take forever. So you have to you do all your animation and you slow it down a lot. So I've got a bit of a render here from one of the comps. Um, I've, I've, sped, I've sped it up a little bit. So yeah, the music was by Armand Tobin, who's uh, an incredible kind of dance musician producer, but he jumped on board and created these mad soundscapes. So you could go there and put headphones on and just stand there and watch it. It was pretty cool. So what I really want to talk about, this is a weird segue into back into R20, but I thought it'd be nice to just put some eye candy in this presentation, you know? It's always nice to see, see some work. But we've got some new growing features that we can work with in R20. So let's. Have a look. They're pretty cool. So I'm going to start off with a basic approach of some stuff that we can do. Here I've just got a landscape object. On there I've got a vertex map. So on this vertex map, as I showed you before, we get this thing called a freeze layer. Freeze layer stores any data. So if we'd have painted this vertex map, then when the freeze layer would store that. But once you've got that data, you can do stuff with it. Like you can grow it, or you can blur it, or you can do all sorts of things. In this example, I'm just going to use this growing method. It allows you to take whatever's there and grow it based on the radius and the strength. So if I take like a spherical field here and I add that, you can see that um, we get this yellow dot. And remember what I was saying right at the very beginning about that all the fields really do is change the value of something. So a vertex map is a great way of visualizing it because the vertices have a weight of either 0 to 100. Or zero. Everyone laughs at me saying naught. It's very English. Um, <laughs> so now if I take this spherical field, what happens is the freeze layer kind of does like a loop. So it looks at the information there, and then it grows it. And then the next frame, it grows it a bit more, and rinse and repeat. So you can create these kind of cool growing patterns. It's about as simple as it gets, really. But even that, even that is kind of interesting in a way. But of course, what we can do is then we can use it like as if we were doing a comp in After Effects or Nuke or whatever, and we can build up all of our layers to make that much more organic and more interesting. And this is a really basic setup, but it sort of gives you a taste of what you could do with it. And in here, I've, got, um, I've just got a random field. And the random field, um, if I just set this to normal for now, the random field allows you to use all your noises that you're used to in cinema. Got a whole bunch of noises. And we can just procedurally generate these values onto our vertex map. So that in itself is just pretty amazing. Um, you know, just a linear fall off or linear field, and you're going to be able to create a gradient, that kind of stuff. And you can combine them all together with all of your composite modes. So for example, here I've added in a modifier layer, and I've just got a curve, and I've just crushed it a bit just to change the, the noise pattern. I think this noise is animated as well. So we get this kind of result. If I set this back to min, I didn't really know what min meant, to be honest, when I started testing this out, but I Googled it. It's the same as lighten in Photoshop. And then you have max, which is essentially the same as dark. It just shows the, the minimum value of the two. When they're composited together, it shows you the minimum. So now if we press play, you can see that we get this slightly more organic result. Just as before, we can take this data from that vertex map, and we can use it in all different places. So here I've got a displacer. If I enable that, you can see that that has the same vertex map in its fall off. So now, when we press play, 
we're just going to get the displacement only where that vertex map tells us to. And this sort of data unification is what makes this workflow so streamlined, because now if I come, I've got a matrix object here, and I've just got all these scary, nasty, virusy things growing over the surface, or they could be trees maybe, or flowers. Um, and then I've got a weight tag on here. So we could take this setup, we could copy and paste it into that weight tag, but it's easier to just take the vertex map and drop it in. So then we only have to go back and change one thing rather than keep changing lots of things. But it, with the vertex map, it would be the wrong way around. It would, because I've got this effector here that's set to scale everything down. So as it displaced, all of the matrices would scale down and disappear. I want it to be the other way around. So I just put an invert on there, which is another modifier layer. And it just inverts the values. And then we just, on our plane effector, we use that weight tag in here. This is set to scale them down. And then now you can see that when we press play, we get our displacement happening, and then we get our matrices on top, and they all move around with the displacement. And if we need to change to where that displacement happens, the distribution is going to change as well. Now, if we wanted to say, for instance, we've got these nasty virus things, we want to put a friendly one in between in all the gaps. You think that maybe you could just take that original setup and just invert it. But what, what will happen is that then the growth pattern will ungrow. So we need to think of a different way of doing that. But it's still pretty trivial and easy. We can just take this original tag that I've got up here. If we remove that folder, we're sort of back to where we were at the beginning. But notice that when I rewind, let me just switch off this matrix. Notice that when I rewind, we end up with this pattern already there. And that's because my freeze layer, as soon as I duplicated that tag, it just stored everything that was there. So we could work with that, or we can just come down here, we just click clear, it gets rid of it. So now this second tag is right back to where we were right at the very beginning. It's just doing the same as the very beginning one. But what we can now do is we can take the very first result and we just subtract it from this one and it's going to leave the holes. So I grab my first tag, I drop that in, I just set that to subtract, and you can see now it's giving us the in-between bits. So now if I switch on my displacer and I enable all of these, OK, this is my friendly one. And on here, I've got the same setup. But notice that this one is called a variable tag, which means it's not linked to anything yet. So you could almost set these things up and have them stored away. And then when you think, OK, now I've painted my vertex map, I just grab that map and just drop it on. And it just basically relinks it. And now when I press play, you can see that now we've got the green ones growing in between. And obviously, you could repeat this. So what we're really doing is we're adjusting that range of values that we want to work with for each separate effect. And anything you use with MoGraph that you've done, and then you can do it using this trick. So these could be kind of, this could be grass, and these could be trees. OK. So someone's going to say, well, look, this landscape, though, it's, it's a polygon object. It's a point object. It's not, very, it's not as procedural as it could be. So how do we keep it really procedural? Well, I've got another example set up to show you how you can do that. We come in here. We can do it using the correction deformer. So the correction deformer is a deformer that allows you to access the components of your object. So in this example, it's allowing me to access the points. Well, you can access the edges and polygons, etc. So on here, I've got a vertex map. This vertex map is set up just the same as the last one. If I pull this down. You can see we've got a freeze layer. On here, we've got this set to grow. And then rather than just using the one spherical field, I've got a whole bunch of these. And they're scattered around. That's just because I want the grow to start from different areas. So I want it to grow on each letter. So if we come back to our vertex map and press play, now you can see that we're starting to get that growth pattern happening. But now we're doing it in a procedural way because my text is still a parametric object. So this is definitely the kind of thing that you can set up and then save and reuse. Because if we hide this and then unhide this matrix object, and you see I've got the matrix here with the weight tag inverted, same as before. And there you go. You can see it's working. If I re press play. We've got a lot more matrices here, but you can see that now we're getting this kind of really nice organic growth, revealing the type. This could be put into like a open VDB, and it would become like a really fluidy effect. It could have fluid, or it could be done with like a 
candy or something like that, you know, whatever you, whatever you can think of, you can do. But the nice thing about this is that if I come back to my text spline, come in here, I can change this. Maybe I'll write Max on instead. Now, rewind when it loads the font. When I press play now, you can see it already worked. You can see now it's going to work. As long as those spherical fields are still touching one of the letters, it's still going to grow the effect. So then you've kind of created this preset. So every time you build these things procedurally like this, you can save them out, and then you can just reuse them in later setups. So this kind of parametric approach is absolutely awesome. So back into uh, Keynote just momentarily. This is an example of, a, a, of um, just a short animation that I did when I was learning how to use this. And this pretty much uses exactly the same trick. And you can see that we've got, two, we've got one noise type, which is a Voronoi, and then I've inverted it. One for the pink, one for the purple. And then where I've got the blue triangles or the pyramids as well, I've used the same noise, but I've just crushed it a bit more so that it only puts the triangles in the very middle. So if I change that noise type, this whole animation would still work, but it would just look totally different. You could use cell, cell noise, and it would all look cellular, you know, or a Voronoi cell or something like that. Very flexible. That one was all rendered with uh, the physical render as well. Um, so yeah, reaction diffusion. It was too long to fit in the slide, so I thought I'd just be cool, man, and take out all the vowels. That's what everyone does. <laughs> but reaction diffusion is like this trendy thing. That I don't really know what it is. It's like when two chemicals react, yeah, it creates this diffusion. <laughs> um, I, like, if you go online, Intagma, who makes some great tutorials. Oh, we don't want to see that one yet. Intagma, who make these great tutorials. They're the guys from X Bonzo. They do a really good tutorial introducing reaction diffusion. And Basically, what it is, is I kind of think of it as like when you're at the office party and you photocopy your face. And then you take that photocopy, but you keep photocopying it again and again, and then the result, and then you take that one, and you get this organic thing that happens where the photocopy deteriorates and it starts becoming a pattern and changing. That's essentially what reaction diffusion is, but it's, more of a it's a bit more scientific than that. But if you take like a sphere or a circle, for instance, and you blur it, and then you crush it with levels or something like that, so it becomes a bit harder. Then you take the same circle, blur it even more than the first one, and crush it. And then you subtract one from the other. So then what do you get left over? You get that little thin bit around the edge that's left. Then you do the same thing to it again and again and again. And each time you do it, this weird thing happens, and it starts to become like this organic pattern. And we can do those now, and they're a lot of fun. So I've got, a, I've got a, this is a really basic example of how you set that up. And then you can kind of expand upon it and start really messing around with it. Because they're kind of tricky to art direct because it's a simulation in a way. But you can definitely guide it like you would a particle system. You can coax it into different ways to do things that you want. So this is probably one of the most groundbreaking pieces I've ever done. Um, and I've got this spherical field on a helix with an align to spline tag. And we're using a vertex map. I love the vertex map because it's a really visual way to show how things work. Rather than if I tried to do this with like time offset, you, it would, you'd just be like, what? But with this, you can just see it and understand it. So if I press play now, all that's going to happen is that spherical field is just going to draw onto that vertex map. So we can do right on effects as well. You can see in my setup here, I've got a freeze layer, just as we used on the previous growth example. At the moment, the mode is set to none. We have a few modes in here. We've looked at grow. Let's look at average. So average, what that does is it basically looks at the values. So here we've got 100. Here we've got naught. It looks at those values and averages them. So it just blurs them. They should just write blur. It's a blur. <laughs> if we use the auto update option, it means that every frame is going to update that. So it's a bit like having a Gaussian blur and just animating the strength of it over time. So if I press play now, you can see we, we get that result. So we get this really nice, soft, blurry result. If you come back to what I said about reaction diffusion, this is kind of exactly what you do. You take something, you blur it. Then you add a curve on top to crush it a little bit. 
Just increase the contrast. Then I've got another freeze layer here. And you can see my bottom freeze layer has got a blur of 4. The top one has a, um, a blur of 10. So if I add this, then I've got another curve. And then I've set this to subtract. So I'm subtracting one from the other. So now when we press play, we're going to get this weird reaction diffusion. And this is, that's how easy it is to set up. And as soon as we do that, we start to get this crazy, weird thing that happens. And that's my brain. Um, but yeah, it's like, it's just interesting already. But we can, like I say, we can guide this. We can coax it. At the moment, I've just got a, a just drawing a spiral. You could be firing particles through the system, you know, and each one triggers a different pattern, and then they'd all interact with each other. Um, whatever, you, whatever you feel like you could do, it could, you could use it like with someone running across the surface, and then as each footprint lands, it's like these things come out. Um, and then you could take that, and you could use it in a displacer, or you could use that for generating clones upon, or you could use it in a shader, or whatever you want to do with it. In this example here, I've just got a random field. It's just set to Perlin which is regular noise. In fact, we can come here, or if I enable it, here we go. Um, but by, yeah, by adding that noise in there, what we can do is we can, we can essentially like coax it to do something else. So if I press play now, you can see that now it's changed the pattern, and, we, and it's moving around that noise pattern. You know, if we scale this up, we're going to get a different result again. You can see, totally different. So like I say, it's a little bit hard to art direct. Sometimes you get this sort of feedback thing. Um, a good example of how you might do this is like, let's change it to something like mod noise. I don't know, 250. Mod noise is like a cell noise. So we should see like a checkerboard effect. And there you go, and you can see that that checkerboard thing is now influencing the reaction diffusion. So you can definitely guide it. And when you get these sort of flickery things, very often you can just pull the, pull the um, opacity down of that layer. Because you're using kind of feedback, that's why it's happening. It's, feed, it's like filming a TV that you're videoing, you know? But you can get some good results with that as well. So that's a pretty simple example. Let's have a look at another one. Here I've got a matrix. Because I just did that with a vertex map, it's quite easy to see. But you can do it with anything. You could do it with a polygon selection if you wanted. In this example, I'm going to do it with a weight tag. So I've got this matrix here with a weight tag. In here, I've set up the same kind of thing, as you can see. I've got the freeze layer, etc. Because I want it to be the other way around and to reveal the clones, I've done the same thing as I did before, where I've just dragged that tag in there and inverted it. So if I enable these, and then enable all my effector and my fields, OK, and rewind, you see now we get this kind of reaction diffusion happening in 3D space. So it starts to kind of get really interesting. And I think in this example, we're using a regular grid array. So it's kind of a bit techy. You could use it for heads-up display, um, that kind of thing. Maybe you want to do something a bit more organic. So I've got another example here. This time, a cube. Not very adventurous. Um, and I've got a matrix object, which is set to fill that cube. So already, it looks more organic. And in hindsight, it's, it's funny, because it, I don't think this technique works so well with big, thick volumes like this. I think it almost works better if it was like a tree structure. You know, if it was like natural coral branching structure, or, or maybe fingers, or um, I've done it with a head, and it, it, didn't, it, it worked, but it was quite hard to see the head. I'll come back to that. Um, so here, if I just enable these, we get a slightly different result now, because it's a bit more organic. And you can see it just works straight off the bat. So it's, it, again, it's like you can set up your, your field system and save that out, and then whenever you need this kind of organic growth pattern, you, you've got that saved. I just come back to the uh, to here. Look, I've actually got a render of that here. Look, so this is this is that 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 shot, and that's just dropped into like an open VDB and then smoothed out. So you can see it's got that sort of coral feeling, but it's just building a cube. It's pretty rad. So coming back into Cinema, 
last thing I'm going to talk about. Um, like I said, it didn't really work very well with the head. So I was thinking, how can I, how can I do this? Uh, you know. And I thought maybe a, another approach would be to, um, rather than filling the whole volume with matrices, how about we just put them around the surface? So immediately it's going to be quicker, <laughs> which is always a good thing in this industry. And actually, it's, it works more effectively because the shape of the head and everything is more defined, so you get a better result. So I think how you approach these things depends on the application and what you're trying to do. Definitely good to fill the whole head with these and try that technique, but actually pushing them over the surface, more efficient. So if I uncheck this plane effect, you can see, there we go, I've got this matrix object. It's just set to object mode, and it's set to, put, what is there, 50,000 matrices over that surface of that head. Set up pretty much exactly the same with the reaction diffusion, but this time I've got two spherical fields. It's just come off there, and those spherical fields are just set to, uh, just pushed between the eyes, like that. That's just to trigger that effect. And that's all it really needs. So now if we hide that, and we come in, and we press play, you can see now we've got that reaction diffusion happening across the face. And the cool thing here is that we can now introduce OpenVDB. And OpenVDB is another new feature in R20. It's been around for a while. But Maxon, the implementation of it is pretty solid. It's a great foundation that they're going to build upon. And one of the things we can do with it is we can now use matrix, ob matrix objects, which don't actually have any geometry. When I render, it comes out black. But they're really fast. We can mesh them now. We can drop those into Volume Builder, which is our way of creating OpenVDB. So if I hide this. OK, just calculating. Um, and you can see now I've got all of these voxels. And we can then take that and we can mesh it. So then we can mesh these kind of results. And we end up with something like this. And these kind of things were just not, not possible before in Cinema 4D until the introduction of OpenVDB and fields. I'm not going to talk about OpenVDB today, but tomorrow I'll be doing my whole presentation on OpenVDB and the kind of stuff you can do with fields. And it's amazing. And uh, now the sales pitch. Uh, so this is awesome stuff. And uh, well done, Maxon, for this feature, because the feature set is incredible. Totally impressed with it. Um, now, I have just released some new training, which is called uh, Learn C4D Fields in One Day. It's just under seven hours. Come on, you can do it in a day. Uh, but it's all about OpenVDB fields, the new system. Um, it's nearly seven hours. My presentation is like 50 minutes, so there's a loads more stuff that I go through. We've got a Seagraph special going on at the moment, and this little edit that I made kind of gives you an example of all the stuff that you will learn on my training. So, thank you for coming. That's it from me. If you want to check that out, go to hellolux.com. It'll give you a list of all the stuff you can learn. Please come back tomorrow and see my other presentation. But thank you for coming today. If you want to follow me on Twitter, that's it. Other than that, thank you very much. <laughs>